Rahim. This is part two of a talk on the current economic crisis in Pakistan and its solutions. In part one, we analyzed the problem and presented the solution. In this part two, we explain why almost no one is presenting this solution and problem and instead they are uh, presenting very complex diagnosis and solutions which will not actually work. So one of the basic problems is that there are false economic theories being taught all around the world which misdiagnose our problems and correspondingly give us the wrong solutions to them. So even though as we discussed in part one the problem is simple and the solutions are simple, no one is seeing it and no one is saying it because economic theory blindfolds our eyes and make us look in the wrong direction for solutions. So we cannot understand economic theory without understanding the history which led to the creation of this economic theory. Today's modern economic theory which teaches us how we can improve, how we can grow, how we can become, uh, have more wealth as a nation was put together in 1995 or so after a set of circumstances which led to the collapse of Russia and uh, this uh, led to American view, China was not in the field competing for global power at that time. So China thought, Americans thought that this is now our century. For the next hundred years, we will rule the world. And they took put together a path to do this. And this path was in the form of economic policies designed to enslave the rest of the world to American domination. Uh, prior to the fall of Russia, the Americans could not do this because there was a competing power and they had to appeal to, to persuade others not to follow uh, the Russian path because the Russian and China communist revolution had been amazingly successful in bringing two peasant uh, societies into the industrial age and had created astonishing progress. So it was a very uh, viable uh, alternative paradigm. But after the fall of Russia, the American way became the only way. So a set of policies was created, which was called the Washington Consensus. It was a one size fits all. This, this is the policy that would be followed by all developing nations to grow. Now, this is a bit strange because um, <clears throat> obviously the development strategy for Peru would be different from the one from Nigeria and that would be different from the one from Pakistan. But no, all of these policies were the same because they were not catering to our interests. They were catering to the interests of the uh, big corporations which were running the USA and they were all designed with only one end in mind how to allow corporations to come into our countries uh, put in foreign direct investment and uh, make money from it and take it back out so one part of it was to cripple the government because the government could interfere throughout the world uh, the government tended to interfere to protect, protect the people from the bad effects of imperialism. They would put up tariffs and barriers to prevent foreigners from coming in and exploiting their people. So the government had to be broken down. Uh, this is done by fiscal adjustment, making the budget of the government so small that it cannot do anything. Um, deregulation means that allowing people to do whatever they want in the private sector. Privatization means taking big government firms and uh, moving them, making them uh, private, uh, normally these would be get bought up by <clears throat> foreigners or those with wealth. And removal of subsidies, uh, basically social services are providing food to the people. This makes them dependent and much more easy to exploit. Uh, at the same time, there are certain things that foreigners needed. They wanted the stable exchange rate so that they could uh, trade their dollars for uh, rupees make their profits and bring them back. If the ex uh, foreign exchange rate is not too stable, then uh, it becomes difficult to move money in and out. Similarly, they wanted to remove barriers to foreign investment. So they, uh, they, they promoted the idea that foreign direct investment is the key to growth. Uh, they introduced trade liberalization and rule of law property rights means that basically the foreigners should be able to invest and then get their money back. Nobody should seize their property. So anyway, all of these rules, the Washington Consensus was designed to ensure maximum profits for the corporations, not to uh, max, uh, not to ensure maximum growth for our nation. 
But this was sold as the set of policies which will create the maximum amount of economic growth for us. These policies were implemented around the globe in, um, uh, by the World Bank in the 1990s. And in the early, uh, in the early part of this uh, century, 2000, uh, the World Bank wrote a, a report on assessing the outcome. And they themselves <clears throat> viewed, understood that these policies have been complete failures. Uh, John Williamson, who is the author of these policies, also admitted that these policies have failed around the globe. They were tried, implemented, and they did not produce any uh, worthwhile results. But instead of rejecting these policies and saying that these are wrong and we should do something else, uh, he came up with an additional point, 10 points, that, okay, these 10 points did not work. We need to actually have 20 points in order to make it work. And obviously, uh, another uh, 10 years later, we're going to need the 30 points because these are not going to work either. Unfortunately, all around the globe, people, serious economists are, uh, are thinking about and implementing these policies as the remedy for our uh, poverty and as the means for growth. The key thing to understand about economics is that it is not a set of policy designed to help us understand how the world works. It is designed to deceive us about what we need to do and it works very well because economic pundits in Pakistan are all talking about basically Washington consensus policies as the means to get out of our current crisis. So economic theory is designed to deceive us, to lead us to the wrong understanding of what the problem is and to uh, waste our efforts in, uh, in trying to achieve these solutions which will not work even if they can be achieved. One of the most interesting examples to prove what I am saying about economic theory being a deception is the East Asian miracle. This book has been written by World Bank itself. And it starts out, it opens with a paragraph which says that these East Asian countries did everything against the rules. They broke every rule of the Washington consensus and they achieved miraculous growth. Uh, so then why is the World Bank uh, saying this? Well, this is very interesting. This book is very subtle. It says that even though these government broke the, rule, broke the rules and they did not follow the Washington consensus, other governments should not follow their example. That uh, there were some special circumstances in East Asia which allowed this failure to succeed. And also that their success is really not due to, not, not because they broke the rules, but because they followed the sound, stable policies of the Washington consensus. And even though they broke the rules, they still managed to achieve miraculous growth. So this is a stupid lesson, but this is the main lesson. And the goal of this book was to make sure that nobody tries to follow their example. So we can conclude this part two as follows. The colonization never actually ended. The white colonizers were replaced by the brown bureaucrats and they continue to exploit the country. Uh, there's a two-pronged mechanism for this exploitation. The rich and powerful receive foreign aid which enables them to stay in power against the interests and the desires of the masses. And the intellectuals are force-fed false economic theories which makes them uh, not able to recognize the real sources of the problem and waste their effort and energy in fighting phantom enemies. So this is the end of part two. So stepping out of the framework of this talk for a moment, there are some larger conclusions which we can draw. And the larger conclusions is that economic theory cannot be understood outside of the historical context in which this theory has been created. And modern economics textbooks and the way of teaching economics completely ignores history. And that makes it impossible to understand economics. And that's part of the game, uh, to keep us blind to what's really going on. Economics cannot actually be understood without politics, without the power struggles, without the fact that the people in power shape the knowledge that we have about this world, and they shape it in such a way as to keep them in power. So our minds are being uh, manipulated for the purpose of the existing power structures. And unless we learn to recognize this, we cannot break free of these chains. And one of the crucial drivers of history, crucial drivers of economics, is the class struggle, the struggle between the rich and the poor. 
and uh, this is not mentioned at all in economics so again economics serves to deceive us about what the real problems are what the real issues are and how we can solve them